hear the word of God. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of this discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of, of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Pray with me. <clears throat> O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, today we begin three weeks of a faith and film sermon series, uh, which is at one level a shameless attempt to get you to come to church in August. The promise of a little entertainment. But really, it comes more from our Reformed Presbyterian heritage of learning to see all the world with the eyes of faith. And that means seeing even movies with the eyes of faith, because movies very often raise up the questions that we're, a society is facing, the fears, the anxieties. And very often movies address them. Sometimes very obviously, sometimes intentionally, like the movie Selma, about the Civil Rights March. But sometimes not intentionally. I mean, really, what about a superhero movie? And why are there so many superhero movies these days? What's going on there? Well, today we're talking about Avengers. Specifically the movie The Age of Ultron. You've all seen it, right? <laughs> no? Well then let me give you a brief plot summary. <laughs> a lot of our kids have seen it. The Avengers are a team of superheroes. Some human, some more than human. They were invented by Marvel Comics back in 1963. They're known as Earth's Mightiest Heroes. They're called Avengers Assemble. And here's the latest group of those assembling for this particular movie, Iron Man, Captain America, there with the shield, the Hulk, any of you remember the Hulk, Bill Bixby used to play the Hulk on TV, Thor, Black Widow, Hawkeye, the guy with the arrows on the end there. This is the latest incarnation of the Avengers, but there have been many come and go over the years in the comics. But here, the story today, Tony Stark, who is Iron Man, he's a philanthropist, he's a playboy, he's a scientist, and when he wants to save the world, he goes out as Iron Man. Well, he decides we need a better way for, to protect the world. You can see him here in this next slide here. Some of you know Robert Downey Jr. He fears some extraterrestrial threat. And he wants to safeguard the world in a way even beyond what the Avengers themselves can do. And so he decides that what he needs to do is create an ultimate kind of a power. And so with the help of a mysterious stone, of course, he creates an artificial intelligence that becomes Ultron of the title, the Age of Ultron. Here's what Ultron looks like, fearsome indeed. Uh, seems like all is well. He's given, he's programmed into this Ultron character, the, the job of, of saving the world. And Ultron has achieved awareness, sentience, is now an independent being. Artificial intelligence has advanced that far. He's now able to think on his own. And he has this job to save the world. Well, what 
what Tony Stark, the scientist who is Iron Man, did not foresee, what no one could foresee, but anybody who's read the Bible could probably foresee. Who is the biggest threat to the survival of the Earth? We are. So this ultimate machine with great firepower figures out that he probably needs to destroy the world in order to save it. Now, Paul Essay, who's an online writer on, on film, says this might be the most spiritual superhero movie that's ever been made. Uh, because there are all kinds of direct allusions to the stories in scripture. And this one obviously sounds like Noah, this all-powerful, all-knowing thing has decided that humanity is just not good enough, and so wants to start over. Which is, you know, how the Noah story begins. So here is this creative, this creative, all-powerful being now who wants to destroy humanity. When the earth starts to settle, God throws a stone at it, is what Ultron says at one point, and he's prepared to do a little bit of smiting on his own. He's going to smite the earth. He quotes Jesus from Matthew, on this rock I will build my church, but not the same way Jesus meant it, of course. So in a way, Tony Stark, the scientist, has created a god. And this is not a good thing after all. And that's a very biblical message, really, that when we create something and put it in the place of God, we pay a high price. When we play God, we probably put someone else into God's place, something else. The results are not pretty. And that's been the subject of things, stories, films from Frankenstein to Jurassic Park. Remember Jurassic Park, after the dinosaurs have been created, Ian Malcolm, the character, says, you scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could do this that they didn't stop to think about whether they should. Well, here in... Ultron, with Ultron, Thor says to Tony Stark, the inventor, this could have been avoided if you hadn't played with something you didn't understand. So once again here, the, the hubris, the sinful pride of humanity has been exposed in this superhero movie. But again, I have to come back to why are there so many superhero movies? I mean, 1978 was the reboot of Superman with Christopher Reeve. And then Batman came about 10 years later. And there have been some here and there, but since the early 2000s, there are four or five, sometimes six or seven superhero movies a year. You can look it up. Why is that? Well, my son tells me, part of that is because you can do special effects now that are awesome. <laughs> I mean, creatures can fly. Death rays can be fired. There are all kinds of amazing things you can do that you couldn't do 30 or 40 years ago. And of course, all these movies make an incredible amount of money. But again, so Hollywood keeps making them because they still make money. But again, that begs the question, why do so many people want to go see a superhero movie? It can't be an accident, really, that the numbers of superhero movies went up in the early 2000s and have stayed up ever since. It can't be an accident that it's in a post-September 11th world that people are flocking to see superhero movies. It can't be an accident that after that experience in 2001 when we, a nation who had been protected by oceans for all of our existence, suddenly found that oceans can no longer protect us, that we are at risk by forces beyond ourselves. And of course, that fear has continued and perhaps even increased in the years since 2001 with, with the, ne the never-ending war on terrorism, with ISIS, with so many concerns. And so there are superhero movies coming out this year, but there are even more planned for 2000. 16, and 2017, and 2018, you can see the line of production. And the superhero answer, of course, that is at first on the outside comforting, I guess, is that there are forces of good that will defeat the forces of evil. 
And they will do so with power, with force, with violence. Because violence is needed to defeat violence. That's what happened in the, happens in the Avengers movie. Of course, at the end, and most every superhero movie you'll see, toward the end there is a cataclysmic battle. You know, our, our heroes have been down for the count. They have been, they have been uh, defeated, wounded. But at the end, there is a, an ultimate battle by which they will emerge victorious and the threat will be vanquished. That works in the movies. But it doesn't always work in real life. I mean, we all know in our own arguments, our own disputes with other people, that the person who outshouts the other one, the one who shouts the loudest, may win the argument, but that doesn't end it. That very often, that battle will be refought some, in some event a day later, a week later, months later. Those who shout the loudest do not always win. It's not over. And it's the same with violence. We look at our own history. The Civil War ended in 1865, but the effects of it continue to this day. We look at age-old hatreds all around the world, where people continue to fight old battles that are kept alive again and again. So violence, sometimes, often, is not the last word in a dispute. Walter Wink, the biblical star, scholar, talks about the myth of redemptive violence. The mistake of thinking that we can really solve problems for good with violence. We may end the conflict for a time, but we don't solve the problem. And he points at our entertainment as reinforcing that myth of violence defeating violence. Now the way of Jesus is different. The way of Jesus is the way of love. The scripture we read today, Paul, centuries ago, points out what we know very well today, that, that this, this way of Jesus looks like foolishness. It looks like weakness. Christ crucified, he says. It's foolishness to many, but it is the power and the wisdom of God. How does that work? This, this, what Jesus does on, on the cross, Christ crucified. Christ who refuses to return evil for evil. That's the only way to break the cycle. Is the way Christ breaks the cycle. By refusing to return evil for evil, by willingly going to the cross, willingly accepting the sorrow and the pain of the cross. He breaks the cycle of evil and removes evil from circulation. Does that always work? Not necessarily. But by refusing to return evil for evil, he returns again the decision to the other to decide, am I going to continue on this path or is there something transforming? Is there something amazing? Is there something life-changing about responding in love, even to evil, <coughs> that can transform the moment, can transform the situation? Now, I'm not going pacifist on you here. There are times you have to stand up to a bully on the playground and out there in the world. There are times, I believe, you have to meet force with force. But when we do that, we never do it thinking that that's going to fix it, thinking that that's going to solve it. That may be a necessary step, but the only thing that removes evil, the only thing that breaks that cycle, is the power of love. Superman, you know, is the original superhero. He goes back to the 1930s. And I always thought that, you know, as, as cool as Superman was, I always thought his costume was a little, like, juvenile. I mean, he's running around. Okay, the tights, okay, they all have tights. 
a cape, fine, you probably don't need a cape to fly, but it looks cooler, you're fine. But most, the most juvenile part was there's just a big S. A big S for Superman? At least Batman has a bat, you know, but an S for Superman? Well then, for some reason, I delved into it a little more. Turns out the S is actually not for Superman. The S is for a Krypton word, Krypton is home planet, the word for hope. Now, you know, the symbol of our faith is a cross, which is a sign of defeat, a sign of sorrow, a sign of death. But to us, it's a sign of love, of the endless love that God has, the lengths to which God is willing to suffer in order to break the cycle of evil. And because it is a cross, it is a sign of sorrow and suffering. But because it's an empty cross, because Jesus is no longer on the cross, because we believe in a resurrected Jesus, it's also, it's also a sign of hope. Because it takes the world seriously with its darkness and its sins and its evils, but also because it transforms that power, those darknesses, those sins, those evils, it transforms them with love. There's an ass on Superman's chest. But there's a cross at the center of our faith. A cross that, all appearances of the contrary, is the power of God. Pray with me. Gracious God, sometimes your way looks like foolishness. But your way is the only way to that world which is your, your last and best gift to us, a world where the last word and the only word is love. We pray in Christ's name, the one who is himself love.